We're going to start the next, this next session talking about um, multidisciplinary care. And I'd like to welcome to the stage Melissa Enfinger. Uh, with her presentation, Building Local Mental Health Support Through Education and Collaboration. Thank you, Melissa. Make sure this is at the right height here. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Melissa Enfinger, and I am a Director of Care Services for the ALS Association, and I'm situated in the state of Alabama. So for those of you not from the states, that's in the southern part of the United States. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> So I'm very honored to be speaking to this International Alliance audience today and would like to thank the APF organizers and all of you for allowing me this opportunity. So given the audience and some of the themes we have seen in presentations throughout the week, I know that we can all agree that mental health is an essential part of multidisciplinary best practice care. Unfortunately, many of us also realize that it's a piece of care that is often inaccessible or undersourced for many persons living with ALS, MND, and their families. So in today's short presentation, I would like to speak with you about building local mental health support through education and collaboration. I believe that the model that we are creating is a way to build capacity and competencies of community mental health providers, leverage the expertise of thought leaders and best practice programs already in place, build on the resources where we see gaps in both education and research, and most importantly, to meet persons affected by ALS where they are, in the community, and able to access the care they want to receive when they want to receive it. Okay, so my apologies to all that I have inadvertently left out my thank yous and disclosures slide, so I'll add that to, to upload or to send to everyone. But I do want to acknowledge that we did receive funding to begin our mental health support program from MT Pharma America. And I also want to thank our partners, including Mental Health America in Montgomery, particularly Dr. Cynthia Bisbee and Charlene Robinson. I also want to acknowledge several of my friends and colleagues who early on decided to champion this program and work to build some of the educational components, including Dr. Melinda Cavanaugh, who um, was a big part of our first symposium. Um, I assure you that there are many, many more people and supporters that I don't have time to name here, but their contributions are known and valuable, and I thank each of them. So a quick program overview, as you see here. Um, as with most programs, this one was created directly from recognizing and hearing from people living with ALS and their family members about a major gap or need for services and mental health. Now internally, I know that we were aware of this lack of services basically forever, but um, that need was exaggerated, exaggerated by this global pandemic y'all might have heard about. And um, at the same time, many of the basic resources and coping mechanisms and programs that we had in place were affected. So it really brought to the forefront that need for increased accessible mental health support. And it was just critically important to go ahead and do everything we could to address that need. So in Alabama, the ALS Association began our mental health program with several, several overarching goals. Uh, as stated on the slide, we wanted to be sure that, our program, that in our program design, we found ways to provide care not only in the short term, but to build capacity and competence that could create long-term solutions with lasting impact. We also recognize that it would be important for the program and supports 
that we built to be flexible enough to be supportive even when external factors and the disease progression itself presented additional barriers. We were also quite cognizant of the fact that creating a multifaceted, robust mental health program would take several years and a good bit of time and resources to build to full capacity, and the fact that we did not locally, internally have all of those, uh, that time and resources. So when we began um, the program in October of 2021, we focused first on building the fundamental components, um, hoping, of course, to maximize our impact quickly and strategically. So this gentleman is um, Mr. Jim Ream and his granddaughter, Layla, and he sent me this picture. And because I love him and I love it, I just thought I would include it. Um, he said, put it in whatever presentation you want to. And I just thought this was like a little way of giving y'all a little bit of the glimpse of um, privilege that I have to know them. So um, I just forgot where I was. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so we, we wanted to, um, when we created the program, we knew that we really had to kind of narrow in on where we wanted to start because it was such an there were so many needs, it was such a vast array of needs that we kind of had to be careful about where could we start building and hopefully see the most impact uh, the most quickly. So there was two primary components of our initial plan, um, a patient referral network and the building of a more formal ALS mentorship initi initiative. So because of the time and scope of what we're doing today, I really don't have time to go into all of the components, so we're really gonna focus in on that patient referral network. All right. So the purpose of the patient referral network is to build a network of mental health service providers statewide to include both public service and private care providers. So we knew that to accomplish that, we would really need to focus first on the development of collaborations and key partnerships, as well as the ongoing development of program resources and sustainability. So at the start of the program, we were able to develop a collaboration with Mental Health America and Montgomery. Mental Health America in Montgomery is one of over 200 affiliates of Mental Health America, which is a nonprofit organization whose work is driven by its commitment to promote mental health as a critical part of overall wellness, including prevention services for all, early identification and interventions for those at risk, integrated care, services, and support for those who need them. So one of the most exciting parts about that collaboration is the fact that Mental Health America Montgomery is part of that national nonprofit. So it was an amazing opportunity because they already have an existing network of professionals, not only in Alabama, but throughout the United States and with platforms that could be um, accessed virtually from anywhere in the world. So in February of 2022, that's this year, the ALS Association in Alabama and Mental Health America Montgomery co-hosted our first special symposium on ALS and mental health. It was a virtual conference with over five hours of content and continuing education credits were available for counselors, social workers, and nurses. The symposium focused on what ALS is, but also how ALS affects the mental and physical health of the person diagnosed, as well as the people around them, especially caregivers and family members. And I know we spoke earlier about the fact that not all family is caregivers and not all caregivers are family, but really all of the people who surround the person in their lives, it, it certainly affects them as well. So for that February symposium, um, we had over 150 people registered, which for some of you that might not be a big deal, but in Alabama that was not quite what I expected. I thought it was going to be a lot fewer people than that, but then I thought, well, you know, a, a lot of people register for things. 
So um, imagine our excitement that when the day came and the data was in, that we had over 125 people who attended all five hours of the symposium online. So it said to me, I think that we're on to something. I think there's a need here <laughs> that we need to go ahead and continue. Um, it is also still available on recording, not with the CEs, but anybody who is interested, I am more than willing to, to share that resource. And since then, it has also um, been shared and accessed by um, and access by at least 50 individuals the last time I looked at it, but again, it's still available uh, without the CEs, and I'd be glad to share that. Um, one of the things that we asked participants, and this was an important part of it, at the initial symposium, was to share with us what additional training, resources, or information that they felt like they needed in order to provide the best care for people affected by ALS. And so when we um, did those surveys and looked at the data, there were two really overwhelming needs that came back as, as the highest rated. Um, number one was how to work around communication barriers, um, especially doing therapy with people who couldn't speak. So I guess you guys heard just a few minutes ago from uh, Lisa Bruning, who was one of our speakers at a follow-up. Um, to address that. Um, they also asked for additional training on issues associated with end of life, grief, coping, and those serious illness conversations. So in May, and I know Lisa touched on this a little bit already too, um, in conjunction with ALS Awareness Month, that was also Mental Health Month, that was also um, Assistive Technology Speech Communication Month, as if this whole thing was just meant to be, uh, we were able to do another um, two-hour training specifically on how ALS can affect communication, um, the experiences of people who support um, people with ALS, and strategies they've used to work um, with some of the barriers, and some of the strategies in the literature we'd like to further explore. So you saw a little bit of a snippet of uh, what Lisa was able to um, talk about in her presentation, but that entire two hours is also available on recording, and I'm glad to share that with, with anybody who'd like to see it. Oh, I guess I'm still on this slide. All right. Uh, we have plans to host another full five-hour symposium in conjunction with Mental Health America in winter of 2023, so stay tuned. And please reach out if you are interested in attending or presenting for us, because I've heard an awful lot of great presentations in the last few days, and there's um, a lot we can really learn from each other and really leverage from each other. So we are working with Mental Health America to build additional trainings and also host a training hub for members of the referral network. So it's really important to us that the program be collaboratively built and informed directly by the needs of people living with ALS MND, their family caregivers, their family members, and the mental health support professionals themselves. We want to know what is needed and then once it's built, how it's actually working or not working. That outcomes piece is really important and is um, one of our next steps. So I included this slide, and, and in this room, I don't know that it's particularly important that when I say persons affected by ALS, that of course I mean um, people who are living with ALS, um, family caregivers, spouses, parents, significant others, children, adult children, um, siblings, so I know that's been a theme throughout this whole week here, but I wanted to include the slide because it is really important that I set that expectation, especially when we are um, dealing with um, people who are not currently part of a multidisciplinary care and we're doing um, outreach to community professionals. And this is just a quick shot of our initial program flyer that we put out to recruit members of our network. Um, it highlights the fact that we have the educational component and content that's being developed, but there's also existing resources for persons living with ALS, 
their family members, children, and school counselors. In fact, one of our very first activities we did at the beginning of the program was to mail an outreach letter to each of the 119 um, school district mental health coordinators in the state of Alabama, which is a pretty new position they've come out with um, in the last year. So each school district within the state of Alabama has a mental health coordinator, and they are over all of the school counselors, but they are also um, help to get those community support. So we just thought it was important for them to know what we had available and that we were there as a resource as well. Um, from those 119 letters that we put out, um, we did receive follow-up requests for copies of the materials from um, 28 of those coordinators and even ended up being connected with a few new referrals for people living with ALS that we were not previously connected to. So in the interest of time, I need to skip through a few of these slides, but I want to pause on this one, the, the please tell them slide. Uh, when we were initially talking to some of the individuals we support about creating this program and the opportunity that we had to do education and outreach with community professionals, there were lots of conversations and lots of comments, and most of them started with, please tell them. So I wanted to just highlight a few of those for here today, and I'm pretty sure, again, given the audience, that you'll have heard most of these. But uh, number one, try to be flexible and understand that my needs as a person living with ALS and the needs of my caregiver are unique. We may need you to think outside of the box and be available in different ways than you may be to more, quote, typical patients. Um, find out how I communicate and be patient with me so I have time to tell you what you need to know. And then here's a story. Um, I tried to talk to my therapist and use my speech device, but it took me so long to get across what I needed to say that there was not time to get to it. Most of the time, I can tell that people are anxious for me to get it out more quickly, so I just say never mind and let the thought or feeling go. It feels very frustrating and lonely to not be heard. Another one, time is very precious to us, and we need professionals that are willing to be proactive in our care. By the time we receive a diagnosis of ALS, many of us have been experiencing symptoms for years and have been sent from specialist to specialist and undergone tons of testing well before we got to you. Um, another, the level of loneliness and isolation that comes with this disease is something I cannot even put into words. It feels like there is just no way anyone can understand what we're really going through. And then I remember sitting in the room and the doctor telling me I had ALS, and then, well, I guess I was in shock. I don't really remember very much of what was said after that. Many months later, I feel like I'm still trying to process that day, but I can't. Things are happening so fast and there's so much to think about. So I thought all of that was really important feedback from uh, people that we needed to share with those community providers, but also to kind of think through ourselves as ways to help support people in those situations. So I'm gonna skip through a couple of these things, even though I hate to, but y'all find me because they're really important. Um, I'm just running out of time here. So what I really wanna get to is this next steps. So what is next and how do we build from here? So we definitely want to continue to develop and host trainings in partnership with Mental Health America and Montgomery and hopefully beyond. We also want to further research and development and develop resources for mental health professionals on specific topics as informed by the needs of the individuals affected by ALS and the stated needs of the individuals that um, wish to receive the training. I'm also really, really excited about the potential to look at building in some academically rigorous outcomes interviews and surveys for those professionals within the network so that we can look not only at outputs, but outcomes about how is this training actually affecting uh, their practice 
So that is one big potential we have hopefully coming up. And also building additional collaborations and partnerships in Alabama, but beyond. And one of the reasons that we're really here today is the opportunity to connect with all of you to help build those resources and collaborations. So with that, um, I thank you again for the opportunity to share, and I look forward to connecting with some of you. So here's my contact information, and have a great rest of the conference. So thank you so much. It sounds like your symposium kind of filled a vacuum of need that all the professionals could get together and uh, share and learn from each other. It sounded a wonderful, um, wonderful symposium. I'm afraid we don't have time for any questions. No, no, Jessica, there's no questions. But thank you very much. And I'd really love it for you to share the link for those educational programs. Absolutely. I'm sorry. I'm from the South. We talk slow. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.